Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Trumpet Daily. I'd like to begin today by asking a question. What if you were an Eastern European? Perhaps some of you are, but for those who are not, what if you and your parents and their parents had lived your entire lives sandwiched between Germany and Russia? Well, you would see the Crimea crisis much differently. You wouldn't just debate about it over lunch and then forget about it and go on with your day. You would remember the Soviet Union. You would remember the aftermath of World War II. And after seeing Vladimir Putin steal part of Ukraine last month, you would probably be terrified right now. And you'd be saying, we've got to do something. For the Eastern Europeans, there's no going back to business as usual. That fear that they have in the wake of Crimea is going to trigger a powerful reaction. Europe is about to unite. Eastern and Western Europe are going to lock together suddenly and dramatically. And believe it or not, the Bible precisely predicted that this would happen. We've been prophesying about this for over 70 years. Herbert W. Armstrong said that Eastern Europe would become a vital part of a new European superpower. He said that back when much of Eastern Europe was absolutely getting dominated by communism and the Soviet Union. That was back when the Soviets literally controlled half of Germany itself. But Mr. Armstrong said that Germany and a number of these Eastern European nations would ultimately join a resurrected Holy Roman Empire. This prophecy is decades old, centuries old, in fact, and it's directly related to the Crimea crisis. In Ezekiel 38, in verse 2, God prophesied about a prince of Russia who would cause trouble in this end time. And we're now to the point where we can name names. We know who that prince is, most likely. My father wrote about this prophecy just two months ago at The Trumpet. Read it again online here at thetrumpet.com and just think about that title, The Ukraine Crisis Was Prophesied. Ezekiel 38 talks about Gog, Meshach, and Tubal. These are all prophetic names for Russia. It also speaks of Magog. Magog includes China. We've talked about this Russia and China alliance. Again, if you haven't done so yet, go back and read that article. It proves what this prophecy means today in much greater detail. Today we're seeing that prophesied Prince of Rosh taking strong action and he's having an earth-shattering effect on Europe. This is why we've been telling you to watch how Europe reacts. This isn't just about the amazing power that Russia is amassing and using. This is also about how Europe will respond. Why? Because it's shaping the composition of the prophesied Holy Roman Empire. The Crimea crisis is helping fulfill two major prophecies. First, it's forcing German leaders today to move urgently. They're scrapping their post-World War II pacifism, and they're working to unite this Holy Roman Empire. And now that Vladimir Putin is on the move, they're doing it quickly. The second prophecy the, the Crimea crisis is triggering is that it's forcing all of Europe to realize that they need a strongman of their own. This gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world. And he said unto me, you must prophesy again. When Russia invaded Ukraine and took over Crimea, it shocked the world. In just one single stroke, Russian President Vladimir Putin redrew Ukraine's borders and rewrote the handbook of modern warfare. The Associated Press said on March 14th that Putin was making Eastern Europe tremble. This is what one Eastern European, the, the president of Lithuania actually, who uh, had an emergency meeting over what was happening there with the European Union. And she said, Russia today is dangerous and Ukraine will be Moldova and after Moldova will be different countries. They're trying to rewrite the borders after the Second World War in Europe. Second World War, rewriting the borders. 
I mean, for an Eastern European, could there be any worse memory than that? Going back to that Associated Press report, uh, this is from March the 7th, I believe. He says, from leaders to ordinary people, there's a palpable sense of fear that Russia, seemingly able to thumb its nose at Western powers at will, may seek more opportunities for incursions in its former imperial backyard. The question many people are asking is, who's next? So what will be the next move for Mr. Putin? There was a story in the International Business Time on March the 29th, which uh, quoted a, a top aide of Vladimir Putin, one of his closest advisors, who said that Ukraine was just the beginning. And then he went on to list uh, areas like parts of Georgia. He mentioned Ukraine again, uh, Belarus, the Baltic states, even Finland talking about these regions as if they, they really belong to Russia. Finland, of all places. I mean, Finland wasn't with Russia, I guess it was back in World War I, the last time it was, and in World War II, of course, it fought against Russian uh, invasion. But now Mr. Putin wants to uh, grab hold of that, or at least feels like he has a right to. You can see why so many Eastern Europeans are trembling. I mean, as I said there in the top, I mean, if you or your parents or your grandparents lived in that region wedged between Germany and Russia, you'd probably think quite a bit differently about what's happening. Many people who have grandparents and great grandparents there can remember brutal occupations, can remember being starved into submission by Russian imperialism, they can remember being pulverized during World War II. They remember those things, but most people outside of that region don't think much about it today. But the big question, as we've been asking you on this program and on the Key of David and at thetrumpet.com, is how will Europe react to Russia, I mean, this may be the most important question in the world right now. It's a question loaded with unimaginable ramifications, and you need to know what's happening in Europe because it's about to revamp the world that you live in. Let's just look at a prophecy in Daniel 2. I'm going to read just through a few uh, verses here today that give us a, a large overview of what's happening Herbert W. Armstrong prophesied for years, decades, in fact, that a strong European power would emerge. And he specified that this empire would include nations, as I said at the top of the show, from both the East and the West in Europe. Now, he said this while the Iron Curtain divided Europe, including Berlin itself. He said it when the Soviet Union looked invincible he said it when everyone was paying attention to the United States and the Soviet Union, certainly not Europe, and certainly not Eastern Europe. Now, how did Mr. Armstrong know? How did he know about this? What would happen in Eastern Europe? What would happen in the heart of Europe as early as the 1940s and 50s and 60s? Well, he believed what God prophesied right here in Daniel chapter 2. In this chapter, God showed King Nebuchadnezzar uh, a vision of a giant statue. And that incredible statue represented the powerful Gentile empires that would rule the world for centuries to come. The image has a, a head of gold, and of course that represented Nebuchadnezzar and his world-ruling Babylonian empire. And then after that, there was the chest and the arms of silver. And that represented the empire that came next, the Medo-Persian Empire. And then the, the belly of bronze, Alexander the Great, the Greco-Macedonian Empire. And then finally, this Daniel 2 image, it stood on legs of iron. And this represented the mighty Roman Empire. Now it's interesting that, that God typified the Roman Empire with two legs, because for centuries, the Roman Empire was divided. Its western capital was in Rome and its eastern capital was in Constantinople. 
But the, the symbolism here goes, goes much uh, further than that, as we'll see. This is Daniel 2, as I said, and verse 28, where it says, But there is a God in heaven that reveals secrets and makes known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. Your dream and the vision of your head upon your bed are these. And so, as it says there, this is for the latter days. It covers all of this history from, as I say, the Babylonian Empire right down through to the Roman Empire. And the, the Roman Empire did collapse in 476 A.D. But then this prophecy is for today. So you have to look at other passages of the Bible, Daniel 7, Revelation 13, Revelation 17, to pick up all the detail about what happened in that region after its collapse, the Roman Empire's collapse in 476 uh, A.D. God forecasted that there would be 10 uh, successive governments to come out of the heart of Europe. And the final seven of those governments would be a church-state union, a union of church and state. Talked about at length, as I say, particularly in Revelation uh, chapter 17. But going back to what we read or will read here in just a second in Daniel 2, that image I described to you, the Roman Empire is depicted as having two legs. Two legs. Now you can uh, track the fulfillment of the seven resurrections just in looking at uh, your history books, at individuals like Charlemagne and Napoleon and Hitler, that alliance with Mussolini during World War II. Going back before all of them, you look at uh, Justinian. He restored the empire in 554 A.D. Restored that empire and since that time, and this is the real significance with respect to these prophecies, since the restoration under Justinian, there have been six resurrections of what's been called the Holy Roman Empire, that combine between church and state. Six, and the Bible prophesies of seven which means that one remains. And that's the one that we're seeing emerge out of Europe today. This prophecy is for the latter days. As I said, now switching over to uh, verse 41, moving ahead, staying here in Daniel 2, it says, And whereas you saw the feet and the toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, uh, the kingdom shall be divided, uh, but there shall be in it uh, of the strength of the iron, for as much as you saw the iron mixed with miry clay, it says, and as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. Look at the amazing detail that God gives us here about these two legs. The kingdom will de be divided east-west, uh, but it will have iron-like strength. And then as you move down to the bottom of those legs where the toes are there described, this mixture of iron and clay, and we've talked so often before about just how unsteady, unstable the mixture is of all these different peoples there in Europe, but how that they will coalesce together suddenly, as I said at the start of the program, and they'll have all the strength of the Roman Empire anciently. We're seeing that happen, the very beginning stages of it now. You can tie the ten toes of the Daniel 2 image in with uh, the prophecy about the ten kings uh, in Revelation 17 and verse 12. But the symbolism is also, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's revealing here, respecting the two uh, parts of Europe, the two legs of Europe. There's to be an eastern leg and also uh, a western leg, suggesting that of these ten kings, five would come from the west and five would come from the east. Now let me just take you to uh, a number of quotes uh, from Mr. Armstrong's literature, Herbert W. Armstrong. This is from 1981. Notice he said, when this Holy Roman Empire does happen, it will happen suddenly, so quickly it will take your breath, and the whole world will gasp in awe and wonder when they see the things that are prophesied, when they see it. I mean, they're going to gasp. He continues, it says, for example, 10 nations in Europe, probably, notice this, probably five of them in Western Europe and five in Eastern Europe, reviving, resurrecting the so-called Holy Roman Empire of the Middle Ages. He wrote that statement in 1981. 
That's over 30 years ago. And, and he prophesied about this very event even long before that. I can take you back further. This is from 1952. Good news. 1952, April. He said Russia may give East Germany back to the Germans and will be forced to relinquish her control over Hungary, Czechoslovakia, and parts of Austria to complete the Ten Nation Union. It's talking about Germany swinging back to the West. Germany reuniting. And those Eastern European states being freed from communism. Mr. Armstrong was saying that when they were being oppressed by communism. 1952, this is from 1955, some of the Balkan nations are going to tear away from behind the Iron Curtain. Russia probably will lose still more of the Eastern European satellites. See, now that's what Putin's now going after, because that's already been fulfilled. Putin's now going after to try to get it back. And now it's awakening a beast in Europe. And we're seeing these two powerful movements coming to the fore, even as the United States is settling into the background, a superpower, a superpower that once was powerful, a superpower in name only. Now, how did Mr. Armstrong know about all this? Decades, 60, 70 years before it happened. How did he know? And it should raise some thought-provoking questions, even in your mind. We've got this little booklet. It's actually a fairly good-sized, beautiful booklet titled, He Was Right. <laughs> the subtitle, Remembering Five Decades of Accurate Forecasting by Herbert W. Armstrong. How could he possibly predict all? I mean, a lot of this has been fulfilled. I mean, there's more to come. You add Ezekiel 38 and some of these other prophecies in, in Revelation 17 and such. And yes, there's more prophecy to be fulfilled. But much of what he talked about there, as I just showed you in those quotes, the Soviet Union giving up those Eastern European satellites, Germany re, uh, unifying, those things have happened. Now, this should really just make prophecy come alive. Uh, prophets and, and prophecy, I know they seem so abstract for many people to a lot of modern people today who see it as far out or way off. But look, what we're talking about here is, is not just some speculation about what's going to happen 10, 15 years from now. This is history. Much of this is history. And there's much more prophecy that's being fulfilled even as we speak. Right now we're seeing the eastern leg and parts of, uh, the, well, parts of the eastern leg and the western leg uh, begin to come together. And when we come back after the break, I'll talk to you a little bit more about how one nation in particular there in the heart of Europe is reaching out to protect those Eastern European nations. We'll be right back. The indescribable wreckage of the Second World War left hundreds of thousands of civilians in Germany wandering around helplessly, hungry and homeless. Every major city in Germany was buried under a heap of ruin. Adding insult to these devastating injuries, the United States and Britain jointly stated, It is our inflexible purpose to destroy German militarism and Nazism, and to ensure that Germany will never again be able to disturb the peace of the world. Germany had just received one of the worst beatings ever in the history of modern warfare. Its military might had been destroyed, its infrastructure crushed. Against this backdrop, even as Roosevelt and Churchill offered assurances that German militarism had been permanently dismantled, Herbert W. Armstrong warned of a prophesied revival of German might to be fulfilled in the latter days. From the very start of World War II, Mr. Armstrong wrote on May 9, 1945, they have considered the possibility of losing this second round as they did the first, and they have carefully, methodically planned, in such eventuality, the third round, World War III. Few could have taken this warning seriously in 1945, yet today, as Stratford noted in 2010, 
Germany has become one of the richest, most technologically and industrially advanced states in human history. Just as God said it would be, Germany has risen from the ashes of worldwide war to become the largest, wealthiest, and most powerful state in Europe. It is the beating heart of a revived Holy Roman Empire. For more information about the prophetic rise of Germany and the Holy Roman Empire, request our free reprint article, The Holy Roman Empire is Back. On April 3rd, Richard Palmer posted an article at thetrumpet.com uh, about Eastern Europe calling for help and how Germany is responding. According to Der Spiegel, Germany's offering Eastern Europe military support, uh, including early warning reconnaissance aircraft and an additional ship for an existing NATO naval force in the Baltic. And even though this military support is starting out small, this really is a huge watershed moment for Germany and for, for Europe. Remember, it was only 70 some years ago that Nazi Germany invaded and, and instigated a war with these very countries. And now it's starting to send its military to protect them. Before Russia invaded Ukraine, deploying the, the German military to Eastern Europe would have surely ignited a scandal. But now we have these Eastern nations asking for German military aid. And Germany is responding. And as Mr. Palmer brings out in that Trumpet.com article, Germany's willingness to commit military forces has surprised quite a few analysts, mainly because the, the German opinion polls show that the general public does not want any increase in German military activity in response to what Vladimir Putin is doing. But at the political level, that reluctance is fading fast. I just have a couple of quotes here. One here first from the German uh, NATO ambassador, Martin Erdmann, who said that uh, many of Germany's NATO allies see Russia's actions uh, as, quote, a historic turning point and, uh, and turning point for the Euro-Atlantic security architecture. I mean, this is, a, as we've been noting, a watershed moment historic tur turning point. Here's a Frank Walter Steinmeier, the German foreign minister. He's typically been pro-Russian in a lot of his views, but notice what he said. Our partners know that we stand for solidarity in the alliance with uh, no ifs and buts and not just when the weather uh, suits. They know that Germany's got their, their back. And then one last comment. This is from the German defense ministry. Uh, well, I don't have a quote, actually, but it's just pointed out that once it receives approval, um, the German Air Force and, and can go in and start training its allies there in the east. Imagine this, <laughs> German forces helping uh, Romania, Poland, and those eastern nations. I mean, this, this is incredible, this development. It's all happening uh, so fast, as I said. I mean, they're... They're, it's not Germany just marching in, they're being invited in. To take you to a quote now from Mr. Palmer's article at The Trumpet, he wrote, with the German public firmly against any kind of military confrontation with Russia, Germany has to take small steps, but soon, in a limited way, German troops will be on the front lines of Europe's defense against Russia. And of course, we're only going to see this power grow as it grows in Russia, as it grows in China, as the power of Iran grows in the Middle East. And it's all leading to an explosion, a spectacular explosion, that we can tell you a lot of detail about because of the many prophecies of God. I mentioned the uh, He Was Right booklet. You can see the number on your screen if you'd like to call today to talk to one of our operators and have them send you a free copy of this. We'll send it out to you right away, free, free of charge, no cost or obligation to you. And this goes through, as is explained there in the subtitle, all of the history of Mr. Armstrong's accurate forecasting. Uh, in addition to that, make sure that you request who or what is the prophetic beast. I mentioned those central passages of Bible prophecy earlier. Uh, in, in relation to Daniel 2, you've got Daniel 7, you've got Revelation 13 and Revelation 17. And all four of those chapters are talked about at length in this wonderful little booklet, 
uh, written by Herbert W. Armstrong. So make sure that you call the number on your screen or go to thetrumpet.com and download both of your uh, copies of this material today. Thank you for joining us today, and we'll see you next time on The Trumpet Daily.